Well, good morning, everybody. I think we'll we'll get started in any uh, late stragglers. We'll just have to uh, catch up with us. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this uh, wintry Saturday morning in the Midwest. I assume most of us are are from here, um, and um, appreciate taking time out on your Saturday mornings to join us today. Um, my name is Richard Hayes, and I'm representing the Chicago Yacht Club Race to Mackinac Committee. Um, and by way of my background, um, I'm an offshore racing sailor and a veteran of 34 Chicago Mack races. Um, before we move into the program, there are a few housekeeping items that I'd like to go over. Um, um, this program is being recorded and copyright protected, uh, and we will make this available for replay um, at the, uh, within the next uh, few days and notices will be sent out. This program is a webinar, which means that you will be able to see the panelists only and not the other attendees um, for questions, um, we do have at the bottom of the screen, I think on, on most of yours, there's a, a Q&A feature and you can post questions at any time during the webinar. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end and we'll answer the questions that we can at, at that point. We'll try to get to all of them. Um, we're going to try to get through this program in about 45 minutes to leave uh, 15 to 30 minutes for questions. We anticipate a lot of questions. Um, if you're having any technical problems um, getting on or anything, uh, send an email to regatta manager at chicagoyachtclub.org. Uh, that email goes to Sydney Simons, who is on here, and she'll try to assist. Um, the purpose of, of today's webinar is to uh, make everybody a little more familiar with and educated about one of the safety devices that is being recommended for use during the Chicago MAC race this year in 2021. Um, and I've, I've got up here on the screen the CMSR, the Chicago Mackinac Safety Requirements, Appendix A, which are the recommendations. Um, and the first item on here uh, on the screen is that each crew member as a recommendation shall wear a dedicated personal MOB emergency signal device with both AIS and DSC capability. And they will have this device programmed to the MMSI number of the VHF radio on the boat that they're sailing on. Um, the last sentence here is that this recommendation is expected to become a requirement for the race in 2022. So with this webinar, um, hopefully people will start to understand a little better what this device is, how it works, and what kind of technology you need to, um, to utilize this best. Um, let's see. Um, I think that um, most of the people on here probably know who Stan Honey is. And, and Stan Honey um, is a supporter of these uh, personal MOB devices. Stan is a recognized offshore sailor and navigator, having done most of the offshore races in the world. And, uh, and he has a quote. Um, that uh, personal AIS MOB beacons and AIS on race boats is the single most important innovation in man overboard recovery in our lifetimes. Um, and I think that uh, pretty much says it all and, and our committee believes this also, which is why we recommend it for use this year and, and intend on making it a requirement for next year. Um, at the bottom there, you can see some of Stan's um, accomplishments. Uh, 
Um, and the one item I didn't put here, if you don't know who Stan Honey is, he actually is the founder of a company called Sport Vision, which is different than the company called Sports Vision, but Sport Vision actually, um, he created the, ten, the uh, first down markers in NFL football games that we all see on TV. Um, and, and that was a, an invention of Stan Honey. So um, he is known in, in certain circles as a, as a tech geek. And I wrote here a, a sailor tech geek. Um, the last part of this introduction here is just uh, identifying who the panelists today will be. We've got Rich Galasso from ACR Art, Artex. Um, and the uh, ACR is the manufacturer of two devices that comply with the CMSR recommendations. The first device is Ocean Signal and its, it's uh, manufactured name is Rescue Me MOB1. And the other device is the ACR AIS Link MOB. Uh, our second presenter today is Ben Stein. He's a publisher of Panbo. Uh, there's also a website, panbo.com. It's a small organization that do independent reviews of marine electronics. Um, and then lastly, anyone in Chicago may know Phil Pollard from, from Crawley's Yacht Yard. Um, and, and Phil is joining us with a few simulations showing how to use this device that he's recorded and, and he will be sharing those with us later. I've asked each of the presenters to give a little further description of themselves as they start. But I think with that, um, I'm gonna hand over to Rich Glasso and he's gonna give us a sense of the different types of electronic devices that some of us are familiar with, including these devices here today and, and show us a little bit more of, and tell us about them. So with that, if I can, figure out how to well well while you're figuring that out rick i'll just introduce myself i'm rich galasso i am the north american sales manager for acr ocean signal um with this company has been around for 65 years uh and we are the industry leader in what most people know us for epurbs and plbs uh, or the all the 406 products um uh, obviously, we're here to talk about the, the MOBs, but I do want to just brush through some of the um, differences uh, in these products. Uh, sometimes there's a little confusion uh, in regards to what, what these are and actually what, what makes them different. So um, just to do a little, a little basics, um, EPIRBs, Emergency Positioning Indicator Radio Beacons, what they stand for, but commonly known as EPIRBs. Uh, and PLBs, personal locating beacons. These are uh, known as 406 megahertz devices. They work with the satellite constellations to help save your life. Uh, these devices, when triggered, will work with three separate uh, satellite constellations, a LEO, a low earth orbit, a MEO, a mid earth orbit, and then a, a geostationary satellite constellation that's over 23,000 miles away from the earth. Uh, so when these devices are triggered, whether that's manually or automatically, uh, they will uh, send these satellite, these 406, uh, they, will, they will communicate through 406 megahertz with these three satellite constellations anywhere in the world. And they will route your information uh, to the nearest uh, clearance house, the nearest uh, ground station. Yeah, hi, Brian. Here in the U.S., that's in, uh, down here in South Florida, where I am. Uh, but there are 59 other countries that have clearance centers as well to coordinate search and rescue. Um, Little differences just to start with between the EPIRBs themselves. Um, that is a, what's called a category one and a category two. And if you remember anything about this presentation, uh, category ones are fully automatic, category two are manual. So these category ones come with a pressure sensor. When the boat uh, goes underwater, rolls, pitch poles, sinks, uh, this will be triggered by water pressure. It will eject the cover off the unit, the protective cover. Uh, it will uh, eject the unit out. The units are naturally buoyant. They will float to the surface and they will sense that they're in water and turn themselves on. Uh, all these 406 link products have 
built-in GPSs, 66 channel GPSs these days. So they will transmit your position. Um, all of these devices uh, uh, on the EPIRB side will run for a minimum of 48 hours uh, and some brands and some models up to as much as 96 hours. Um, uh, they have built-in strobe lights so they can see them at night and they will continue transmitting, like I said, for that minimum time. So fully automatic CAT1, fully manual CAT2. Uh, these are commercial requirements, but we also highly recommend them uh, because just because they're automatic doesn't mean they're not still manual. You can always pull and remove the units, still use them manually, turn them on by activating the, the remote switch or throw them in the water and they will start transmitting. Um, so you don't lose the manual capability just because it's automatic, but it's nice to have a product that's always working for you full time, even when you're busy trying to save your life. Uh, so we highly recommend Cat 1s. Cat 2s, typical applications would be uh, ditch bags, have them packed in life rafts, uh, somewhere in a, in a small bracket, very accessible to where you might be in a cockpit or something along those lines. So that's the real big difference between Cat 1 and Cat 2. Other than that, they're going to do exactly the same when it comes to saving your life. Uh, then that brings us to the PLBs. Uh, these are smaller in size because they're meant to fit on the body. Uh, personal locating beacons only uh, are going to be successful if they're with you, if they're on the body. So they come with uh, various mounting applications, lanyards, belt clips, uh, uh, different ways to attach them to your life jackets, to your belt buckles, stick them in your pocket. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but just have them with you because if they're not with you, they're not going to be able to do what they're supposed to do, which is save your life. Uh, besides being physically smaller, obviously the battery life is going to be a little smaller. So these will only run for a minimum of 24 hours. Uh, once you turn them on, in most cases, that's more than enough. The average rescue takes minutes or hours, uh, depending on where you are in the, in the world, of course. Uh, and the units have to be manually activated. The category one, remember, EPIRB was fully automatic. The category two was a manual. Well, PLBs are also required to be manually activated. You'll have to release the antennas, push the button, and let the thing start doing its uh, its job. Uh, it will also have a strobe light into it. Some of the new ones even have uh, infrared strobe lights as well, so they can see at nighttime even better with the night vision goggles. So, um, so that's the PLBs, personal locating beacons. These are the 406 megahertz products that work with satellites, what we call um, more of a global solution, right? Because they'll work anywhere in the world using satellites to coordinate your search and rescue. Uh, and that differs a little bit so what we're really here to talk about today, which is the, the MOBs. Uh, these are man overboard devices. That's what that stands for, MOB. Uh, we make two different versions uh, here. Uh, the AIS link uh, in the green, ACR green color, uh, and the MOB1 in the uh, ocean signal yellow color. Um, these are the only two units on the planet that are built to also do DSC. Every other man overboard device only runs on AIS. So this is a very unique uh, feature to our product line and in turn has made them very successful. In particular, our MOB1 has been uh, our biggest seller by far. Uh, and reason is fairly obvious, it's smaller. Um, these devices are designed to be mounted inside of life jackets, inflatable life jackets. Uh, Phil will take you through a little demonstration uh, in a little while showing you how that mounts up and how to program them and how to use them. Um, so. Uh, they, they, are, they are meant to be fitted on the body like a PLB EPIRB, right? The personal locating beacon uh, 406 device. These also are, are meant to be worn all the time. They're not going to do you any good in a box uh, in the cabin. So uh, they have to be worn and ideally worn inside an inflatable life jacket. That's where they're really built to be uh, installed. What they will do, uh, if you'll notice there's on, uh, on the units, on both units, there's a little uh, inflate tube connector, which is adjustable. You can put them on either side. So depending on what side of the jacket you have to mount it on, no problem. Uh, the unit will fit into the inflate tube uh, in the jacket. So it can actually be closed into the jacket. So you don't even know it's there. People won't see it. It won't be catching on to anything. Uh, it comes with a clear black plastic cover, if you can see that. Uh, and that's to protect it when it's inside the jacket. So you don't have any rubbing uh, on it that might cause a uh, unnecessary activation. Um, the unit itself uh, has a little arming switch that has to be down in order for you to be able to put this cover into place, this protective cover. So you have to be able to turn the unit on to be able to install it correctly. And it's fine to be on all the time. It will sit there uh, waiting for an activation. The unit itself has a seven-year battery life, so it'll sit there 
for quite a long time uh, uh, waiting to be used. Hopefully you never have to use it. Uh, and the unit itself will transmit for up to 24 hours once it's activated. Um, what makes this very interesting and, and very special, when you, out, when you mount it inside the life jacket, uh, you'll have a, a tether that will go around the deflated bladder inside the jacket, or for some reason the jacket doesn't allow for that, you can tether this with a what we call a weld kit, essentially a little bit of an adhesive that will allow this line to stay taut. And the whole idea is when you install this into a jacket, and again, Phil will demonstrate it, uh, it, it keeps the jacket nice and taut. And uh, I'm sorry, keeps the, uh, the, the cord nice and taut. So when the jacket inflates, it will then pull the cover, pull the cord, which will launch the cover out, rip the, the protective covering off, launch the antenna, turn the GPS on, turn on the internal strobe light, and allow the unit to start transmitting. Within about 15 seconds of that happening, so in other words, you going overboard, your life jacket inflating, and this unit being activated, it will then call back both your DSC uh, radio that is programmed to and the AIS. Now, the, that uniqueness of this unit with the DSC requires the ship's MMSI number. So the MMSI number you have programmed into the DSC radio on your vessel gets programmed into this unit. Uh, again, Phil will show you how to do that in his presentation coming up. Uh, but that will allow this unit, once it's activated, to call back to that radio to alarm it, to show that there's uh, a man overboard in progress, get everybody's attention on the boat, uh, and uh, also show the latitude and longitude right on the screen. Um, at the same time, it's also transmitting on AIS, which is a generic call. So it will go out to every vessel within the range of the unit. Uh, we get this question a lot about what kind of range are you really going to get out of the unit. Uh, the, the unit itself is a one watt unit. It'll transmit essentially line of sight. So we test re relatively uh, regularly to four to five miles without any real difficulty, considering that you're in the sea bobbing up and down uh, with this on your life jacket and, uh, and you know, the, the receiving antennas and, and their heights. Uh, sea conditions all will have an effect, but pretty confident that you'll get about five miles without any troubles uh, and, and obviously could potentially be a lot, a lot greater distances as well. Um, so the unit itself, when you actually have the, uh, I'll take, take the other one here so we can show you a little bit closer. I've removed that plastic, clear plastic cover. Uh, this is the uh, arm disarm switch. You go up and it's now disarmed, down it's armed. You'll also see there's a little clear lens in there. Uh, that's not only just the strobe light, that's also how you program the unit. Again, Phil will demonstrate. The letter T right next to it, uh, that's a test button. There are several different versions of testing. You could test the unit uh, uh, on its own, just so the battery's okay, uh, the antenna's okay, the, is the board inside okay, just that this unit's working soundly. We recommend that about once a month, uh, if you can. Uh, there are also some other tests to test the uh, DSC call and the AIS as well. A little bit more elaborate there, but these features are all built in uh, into the unit. The unit itself is fully submersible. It uh, can go down to a depth of 10 meters and stay there for a minimum of 30 minutes. Realistically, it can go even better than that, um, but they do not float. So you'll notice that there's another lanyard uh, attached as well. Uh, that actually has an attachment point on this unit right here on the top. Uh, so you can secure that inside the life jacket. So in case this gets knocked out of the life jacket, you don't lose it completely, it will sink, it does not float. Um, so uh, when this thing's actually activated, this is sort of what happens. So it's sitting in the tube, you've got the, the lanyard secured in, the tape secured in for the, for the mechanism to activate. You, you hit the water, uh, the, the jacket opens up, it will literally pull the little protective cover right off, it'll launch the antenna, turns the internal GPS on and also starts activating the strobe light. This is just a dummy unit. It's not going off for a reason, uh, but this is what will happen uh, in, in the real world. And like I said, about 15 seconds into this, it will start calling out to the DSC it's programmed to and to also the uh, AIS, uh, the general AIS uh, distress call as well. Um, this is different than the EPIRBs and the PLBs, right? Those are 406 frequencies, megahertz frequencies talking to satellites. So we call that a globalized solution. This is what we call a localized solution, right? Uh, statistics have always told us that you're more likely to be saved by the boat you came off of or by vessels around you. Hence why we developed this product. 
Uh, and it's not unheard of. As a matter of fact, we see quite a lot for people to actually use both and mount them both into your life jacket to have the localized and the globalized solution, right? This is, this is great when there's other people on your boat and when there's other people nearby, when that's not an option, this becomes the fail safe uh, because it does work with a satellite constellation anywhere in the world. So big differences in the applications and the way these products are used. So uh, uh, you'll see a little bit more of this, uh, how this actually works and how it's programmed and set up when Phil does his thing. But for uh, right now, I'm gonna just throw it back to Rick so he can get you on to the next phase. Thank you. Well, thanks, Rich. That was uh, helpful. And um, we're going to shift to Ben now. And um, Ben is going to describe what happens um, when this device becomes deployed, what kind of signals are sent out, how often they're sent out, and what kind of technology you need in order to receive these signals. So Ben, I'll let you take it from there. Thanks, Rick. Um, let's start with a little bit of trying to decode the alphabet soup that we are discussing today. Um, there are a ton of acronyms that we've already thrown around and I'm gonna throw a few more around uh, in a minute, but let's start with the very basics, which are, I think probably everybody on, on this uh, webinar is likely to be familiar with a VHF radio. Uh, I'll probably refer to it as VHF voice from here on out. Since the early 2000s, VHF voice radios have also been equipped with DSC technology, digital selective calling. DSC is designed to enable station to station calling where you can call from boat to boat and also to enable uh, DSC distress calls, the red button on the back of a, D a VHF handset that will allow you to send a distress call to all the vessels around you as well as to the Coast Guard monitoring stations. So that's digital selective calling DSC. DSC operates using an MMSI, a Maritime Mobile Service Identity. That's a number that you are assigned uh, either as part of your ship station's station license from the FCC, or if you are never going to leave the bounds of the US, uh, it can be assigned by Boat US or other boater organizations. Your MMSI is the unique number that identifies your vessel and the radios on it. Uh, Rich mentioned the MMSI with regard to the MOB1 or the um, AIS link. When you get one of these devices, you program it with the MMSI of your boat. The purpose of that is not so that your MOB1 will carry that MMSI, it has its own. Always starts with 972 and designates that it's a safety device. The purpose of that programming is so that your MOB1 or AIS link can make a call to the DSC radio on your vessel in order to notify the people on the boat that you've just fallen off of that there's an emergency. When the MOB1 is deployed, it's going to send that DSC man overboard signal back to the vessel that it's been programmed to transmit to, and it will send an AIS man overboard message. AIS stands for Automatic Identification System. AIS also operates in the similar frequencies to VHF voice, also uses an MMSI to identify um, the sending station. In this case, that sending station is gonna be that 972 MMSI issued to the MOB1 or AIS link. That signal will go to all boats in the area with an AIS transceiver. The other thing that I think it's very important to mention, and I should have mentioned this before I sh shifted to AIS, DSC only works if the MMSI has been programmed into the VHF radio. If you have been assigned an MMSI for your vessel, which you should have for any boat with a DSC equipped radio, none of the DSC functions work unless the MMSI is programmed into the radio. That would include the man overboard message coming out of one of these. It would be a very sad outcome if the steps had been taken to equip the crew with MOB1s or AIS links and everything was done except that the VHF radio was not programmed. Um, I mentioned that because unprogrammed DSC 
functionality in VHF radios is extremely common. Uh, of the boats that I'm on, I probably see it about a third of the time. And I suspect that that's actually less than the, the reality on the water that my, my guess is maybe as many as half the boats on the water don't have a properly programmed VHF radio. Um, it's a one-time thing, you do it and you're done. Um, unfortunately, US regulations actually do make it a little tough to change MMSIs in a radio if you were to have to, and typically that will require support from the, um, from the manufacturer. So um, we've talked basically about what technologies these use, AIS and DSC. When this is deployed, as Rich demonstrated earlier, whether it's by the vest inflating and the inflation tube pulling away, or you know manual activation of the device, um, it will immediately begin transmitting a DSC, in essence, what is a DSC station to station call from the MOB1 to your radio, say, transmitting a man overboard distress. It will also transmit AIS um, man overboard signal. That AIS man overboard signal goes out every minute and is transmitted four times on each of the two AIS frequencies. So it's actually transmitted eight times each minute. It's updated with the most recent GPS position. That signal will make it to all vessels in range. As Rich mentioned, typically three to five miles at least, sea state can have an effect. Bear in mind, you're transmitting from a relatively short antenna on the water. If you are in large seas and you're in the trough of a wave, that transmission will be, the range of that transmission will be diminished. That's part of why that transmission occurs eight times every minute spread out over that time period so that hopefully if you are falling into the trough, you are also rising it on the peak of a wave and one of those transmissions will make out and make it out with pretty good range. Just to emphasize, the only way that you can receive this message if, you, if the person did not come off of your boat is with AIS. A simple AIS receiver will do it. An AIS transceiver will also receive it. With AIS, if that AIS receiver or transceiver is linked to the nav system on the boat, to an MFD, et cetera, you will see that, M that man overboard waypoint on your MFD. Most MFDs will give you the option to automatically route directly to the, the person in distress. Um, additionally, on these devices, and it's, it's ACR and ocean signal are limited by regulation in the United States about how this works. So the functionality is not what I suspect anybody would like, but you can hold, after the device has been deployed, you can hold that test button for five seconds and it will send a one-time all ships DSC distress call to all of the vessels around you indicating that there's somebody in distress. But unlike the other transmissions that are happening once a minute and updated with your position and all of that, that is a truly one-time call. Um, in some ways, it's a Hail Mary. It's a, let me get this out there and hope that somebody receives it. Um, the AIS man overboard signal and the DSC call back to your vessel are clearly your best and highest percentage um, means of rescue. Um, VHF and AIS signals occur over very similar frequencies clustered around 100, between 156 and 162 megahertz. Um, to traditional VHF voice antennas are tuned for the VHF voice antennas. There are separate AIS antennas tuned for AIS frequencies. Um, they're close enough that the crossover will give you okay performance, but dedicated antennas for each function um, is, is the preferred means or a broadband antenna that is tuned across both frequency ranges. Um, when it comes to uh, these signals and the relatively short propagation that you're probably looking for, even a mildly compromised antenna array is going to receive the signals um, and, and 
affect that rescue that, that's fairly critical. Um, I believe those are the, the, the main things about how this works. Um, well, happy to hit on anything further in the question and answer period, but with that, I think Rick, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, Ben, I, I think that, you know, as you mentioned, when this device is deployed, it sends out two signals, DSC, and, and again, if, if it's set up properly and you someone falls in the water, the PFD inflates, this is automatic and it will send out both a DSC call and an AIS signal. The DSC call goes to the boat that you fell off of in the event that it's properly programmed. The AIS goes to any boats within range, three to five miles plus or minus. Um, the DSC, I, I want you to talk a little bit about DSC because different countries regulate this differently. So if somebody is sailing in another part of the world, even in, in Mexico, um, governments regulate the DSC feature. And as, as, as Ben said, the automatic version of the DSC call only goes to the boat you came off of. In other countries, it can go to other boats, um, but that's regulated uh, in, in the US. And, and I'm gonna um, share my screen here, Ben, when you start to answer this, but I'm gonna bring up on the screen something from um, the ACR website, which shows VHF radios that, that are recommended by ACR with DSC that will work in an alarm mode when they receive a DSC call. And some VHF radios won't. And, and, and Rich, you might be able to, um, to, to help Ben here explain this, but I, I want people to understand the, the DSC call and, and what they might experience on their boat with their radios. Sure. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that Ben had mentioned early in his presentation that uh, DSC has been around for a while. Matter of fact, it's been around actually since the 70s. But back in 1999, the uh, mandate came down to all the VHF manufacturers to build what's called an SC-101 style uh, DSC. Uh, and several years after that, maybe a half a dozen years or so after that, uh, they mandated the Class D DSC that you see today in most of these transceivers. What you have to keep in mind is that when MOBs were created, when, when, sorry, when DSC was originally implemented and created in the VHF world uh, and mandated into radios as of 1999, MOBs didn't exist uh, yet. And so there was no real thought process of uh, what, what should be happening on the radio side in regards to MOBs. Uh, so essentially what happened for the MOB manufacturers is we started taking existing capabilities to invent uh, the, the, these products that create these products to work with VHFs. Um, th that world is catching up today. Uh, we have the ability now with modern DSC radios, they appreciate what MOBs do uh, and, and what, uh, what is needed. Uh, there's a beautiful listing that's posted on the screen right now that shows all the current models from major manufacturers like ICOM and Standard. Uh, Simrad's in there. Uh, this is not an exclusive list. There are other products made by other manufacturers around the world. We do recommend that if you uh, are not sure that you contact your manufacturer of the radio that you're using and verify that it will work with the DSCs. Now, work with the DSC is a little relative. Um, it, it, the, 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 the biggest thing you're gonna notice from some of the earlier, let's say radios from more than five years ago, uh, will probably be able to receive the distress itself uh, the actual DSC call itself from the from the MOB. Uh, the difference is in things like testing. You'll see a lot of things pop up. So when you try to do a DSC test from your MOB, the VHF might not recognize that. Um, that's where you'll start to see some variances. Anything that's been purchased uh, within the last few years and anything close to that, uh, manufacturers can update firmware and software to accommodate the existing radio. So it might not be that you might have to get rid of the radio completely. You can just get it updated. So you'll have to investigate it. Unfortunately, there's 
many different radio companies, many different radio models. Uh, and of course, over a period of time, these things change. So what you're looking at, and you can get this from ACR's uh, site or Ocean Signal site, is a, a, a current list of the models that we've verified will fully operate uh, with the, uh, with the, the MOB1 and AIS linked products. Um, so it's not a perfect answer. I know it's still somewhat confusing for people. Um, it's just a matter of the technology sort of catching up with each other. And that's happened now in, in recent years. Uh, but if you're running some older technology, you might want to do a little investigation first. But without a doubt, uh, I want to just highlight something that was mentioned before uh, by Ben and Rick. Um, it, this all starts with programming your VHF properly, right? Uh, the, the whole idea of, of having an MMSI number uh, in the VHF is its own safety device and needs to be programmed and hooked up properly. And I can't emphasize enough that that's where this really starts to break down. Uh, once you're into products like MOBs and stuff, you have a general appreciation for uh, a, a different level of, of rescue and safety. But really, this it starts and, and ends with the radio itself and making sure that's in good working order. Uh, it's properly programmed. It's properly hooked up to your GPS. Those will all make a much bigger difference in the success and you being safe on the water. So that's what I wanted to highlight for you. Yeah, and one other thing I just want to highlight, because um, there was also a question in the Q&A about it. Um, specific models of VHF radios are known to work. In many cases, even the models that are known to work, only later firmwares, only later firmware updates are compatible. So you may need to have your radio updated. Um, that situation is made a little bit more complex by the fact that uh, the DSC testing, as Rick mentioned, there's a standard within AIS MOB messages for how the test works. There is no such standard in DSC. So typically what ends up happening is a station to station DSC call is made, but it's a non-distress call when it's a test. So it's a different, your radio will respond differently to a test than it will to a, a, an actual emergency on the water. Um, that, that simply does make it a little bit more complex. Um, to, to sort of restate some of what we've said already, first of all, AIS is the generalized message. AIS is the message that goes out to all of the boats around you. Um, DSC is the, the message that's going back just to the boat that you came off of. Uh, that's, a, that's a regulatory reality currently. Um, I haven't seen much traction about that changing in the U.S., uh, which is unfortunate because that uh, the technology actually does exist to, to affect better alerting. Um, DSC is more widely equipped than AIS. So anything we can do to get those messages across is, is great. Um, but specifically within the U.S. waters, uh, the bottom of that uh, picture that, that Rick was showing a minute ago does list the, the various countries and what's permitted in each country. The U.S. is... Um, is worse than some and better than others. If this race occurred in Canadian waters, DSC is not allowed at all as part of the MOB device. So it really is, um, you know, it, it's an uneven landscape right now. And to that end, AIS is, is the most effective, but in our waters, DSC does allow another means of alerting the boat the uh, person in the water came off of that that they've lost a, a crew member. And just, uh, I just want to clarify something as well, Ben, because I saw it pop up in the Q&A as well. Um, the, uh, the, the all ships that Ben referred to before, the, effect, the ability, and you can do that here in the US, by the way, uh, to tack on to what uh, Ben just said. Uh, the DSC call is only after 30 minutes. So it will go through its regular DSC AIS emergency transmissions for the man overboard. And then after 30 minutes, you can manually do uh, uh, that all ships DSC call. And it is a manual call. So you'll have to hold the button down to actually activate it and it won't keep repeating. If you want to repeat it, you'll have to do it again. So a little bit of a clarification there for that question. Thanks guys. Um, I think the, the moral of this story that we keep hearing over and over is you, you need to know your equipment and you need to own your equipment. Um, with that, let's shift over to Phil. Phil's got a couple of, uh, of videos that he's done 
and, and he's going to start with how to program the MMSI number into the device. He's going to also show how to pack this um, device into a PFD, and he's using a spin lock. Um, and, and then he's also going to show uh, a test that he's done. Each one of these videos is a few minutes long. So, um, Phil, why don't you take it from here? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Hi, yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, I prepared a few videos here. Uh, and the first one I'm going to show you is uh, how to, let me get up there, how to uh, program the MMSI number into your uh, an MLB1, Ocean Signal MLB1. Now, the process uh, is, is very similar, almost identical for the ACR unit. So um, let me get this video running. And at the end, uh, if I see any questions, I will answer them. In this segment, we're going to program an MMSI number into an Ocean Signal MOB1 man overboard beacon. Now, the first thing that you'll need to do is to get an MMSI number. Now, you can obtain an MMSI number from the FCC or OUS has a service as well for boats that aren't planning on going into international waters. Once you have your MMSI number, you'll need to program that into the VHF radio on your boat. Now that's specific to the VHF radio, so you'll need to go to that manufacturer's website and get information on how to do that. It may be in the manual if you have that, um, but you'll program the MMSI number that you've obtained into the VHF radio. Once you've done that, you'll need to then program that number into the MOB1. Um, once that's done and you pair the two, if you go overboard and this unit is um, deployed, it will send a signal to the boat that will aid in rescue. Now, the first thing you'll need to do is go to the Ocean Signal website and navigate to the MOB1 page. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a configure MOB button here. And if you press that button, it will take you to another screen that um, gives you some options on what installers based on your um, operating system to um, download and install on your computer. So once you've downloaded the installer and installed the application, you simply go to the application, open it up, and you get a little screen that asks you for your MMSI number. You enter your MMSI number. And you hit update device. So then you'll go to your device and you have to arm it by sliding this little red protector down here. And you put, this comes in the box, you put this little protector on and you hold the button down. And it'll go through a series of different blinking lights and you keep it held down until you get to a green light. When you get the green flashing, you let go, you get a solid green light. At that point, you hit the yes button here. And then it's going to want you to hold this up against the screen. And you hit F10 to get started. Can you see the little green bar on the right? And it's showing you progress. Hold it still and don't move it until it goes all the way through. And then once you take it off, you finish. If you get a green flashing light like that, it means you're good. It's the same procedure if you want to reprogram it with a different number. So if you're going from boat to boat, you simply uh, do this over again with a, a different number. And that's uh, how you pair your MOB1 ocean signal to the VHF radio on the boat. Okay, so that's um, how you do that. The next thing you want to do then is pack it into your life vest. And I um, specifically selected the spin lock life vest because it's one of the most difficult because it's tight. So um, I'm going to 
show you how that's done. It's pretty quick and pretty easy. Um, Hi. In this segment, we're going to install our newly programmed Ocean Signal MOB1 into a spin lock light vest. If you do this correctly, uh, the life, the MOB1 should deploy when the light vest deploys automatically. So uh, we'll show you how that's done. And uh, first, you'll want to get a couple things out of the packet. One is this lanyard with the ribbon on it. And the second is this um, short piece of string here uh, that you'll use for a tether. You'll want to attach the tether to the top of the MOB1. There's a small spot there. Just put it through there and tie a little bow on it. And then next, you'll need to remove this little protector here to expose this arming lever here. And then you want to slide, oh, you also want to remove this, which is a place that attaches it to the oral inflation tube. You'll slide this over just a little bit, not too much, because you'll if you go too far, you'll deploy the device. And then you feed this little lanyard through the slot here. Push that back center. And then you'll just luggage tag this by passing it through itself. Okay. Reinstall the protector here and reinstall the clip that holds it to the oral inflation tube. Next, you'll go to your vest, and you go to the side with the oral inflation tube on it, which, so you zip this back, like you expose the oral inflation tube, and you'll simply take this device and clip it on all the way down here at the bottom so that you can still operate the oral inflation tube if you need to with this device on. Next, you'll take the other end of this lanyard and attach it somewhere down here. A good place to attach it is right here in this little toggle that holds the bladder in place. Feed it through here. Tie that off. Make sure you get it nice and tight. And now you're going to take this ribbon and you're going to pass it around the bladder. Make sure it's nice and tight on there. You're going to pass it around the bladder. Once you get to the other side of the bladder, you're going to pass this up through the inside tube uh, slot. Then you're going to bring it around and there's an um, a nice diagram of this in the instructions that come with MOB. Then you're going to feed it up again through the outside slot. And then from there, you're going to take it and feed it down through the inside slot again. kind of tricky, but it's really important that you do this right, because if you don't, this ribbon can slide on this little uh, tab here, and then it won't stay tight when you activate the vest. So then you pull all the slack out of it, get it really nice and tight there, okay? So what happens is that when the vest inflates, the bladder inflates, it will expand and pull this tight and cause this to pop off and this to pull it to the side and for the unit to automatically arm. If it doesn't arm for some reason, once this gray little slide is off, there's a button in there that a button in there that you can press and manually arm. So once that's all done, you just kind of tuck it all back in here. Zip it down. Snap it up. And it 
it's all set. Okay, so that's um, the next step. And I've got one more very short video because once you've done that, you're going to want to make sure that it, um, that you've done it correctly. And it's uh, quite simple. Um, we'll show you how that works. station on uh, Vincitori, the Southern Cross 52. Earlier, when I programmed the MMSI number into the MOB1, I used the MS MMSI number from Vincitori. So once you've done that, you've programmed the MMSI number into your MOB1, you've installed it in your life vest, you should check to make sure that it's correctly paired with the VHF radio on the boat. And that's a pretty simple operation. Let me show you how that works. Access our MOB1. I'm going to take off this little plastic protector here, the clear plastic one, and then you hold down this test button until you get a solid red light. Let go. And you can see that it sent out, it'll give you a strobe and a green light. So it's a good test. And if we look at the screen on the VHF radio. In this case, we have a base station VHF, and I'm also holding a wireless handheld VHF that we keep up in the cockpit. Uh, you can see that it's recorded a routine station to station DSC call, and that's uh, what is broadcast by the MOB1 in the test situation. It also notes the MMSI number, and that matches the MMSI number on the MOB1. Once you've uh, determined that this has happened this way, you can be confident that if the MOB1 is deployed, it will send a DSC distress signal to the vessel uh, and it's paired correctly with the VHF radio. Okay, so uh, a couple questions here. Uh, any chance of damaging the inflation bladder uh, of the spin lock when deploying? Um, and I think um, not, no, not at all. It's, it's, it's separate from that. Um, and the, they're designed to, uh, to pop open and, and that ribbon is fairly soft. So it's gonna uh, distribute the load on the bladder if that's what you're concerned about. Um, um, and someone asked if they bought their spin lock through us, will we put the AIS in? Uh, yeah, bring it down and our guys will help you out. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, we do sell these. <laughs> Um, the issue, uh, the issue with using the same MMSI is now um, that two radios. Oh, that's an answer for someone else. I'm going to hand this back to Rick, and um, we'll uh, do a question and answer, I guess, at the end. But uh, if anyone has any specific questions, I'll I'll dig through this now uh, when I get a chance and answer those. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Phil. Uh, there's just a couple things I wanted to go over before we get into Q and A. But um, I think the 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 lesson here. Uh, or the moral of this story is um, don't wait till the night before a race to do all of this. It, it doesn't happen in 10 minutes. And, and programming these MMSI numbers, um, Phil made it look easy. Um, it's not necessarily that easy. And, and if you sail on a new boat, you're gonna have to get the MMSI number for its VHF radio and program that in. And so um, I think we, we need to, uh, you know, if you're gonna use these devices, um, don't wait till the last minute. One thing I wanted to talk about is um, uh, as more and more of us get these devices um, that we're gonna wanna test them. And, and the test that Phil went through um, is, is a fairly easy test. If you ever want to test this device and actually set it off with a full deployment, um, you need to contact the Coast Guard because the Coast Guard is going to um, potentially um, get involved. Once, if you actually deploy this and it sends out DSC calls and AISs, and there are boats in the vicinity that receive that AIS and they're going to get a little MOB symbol on, on a chart plotter or an MFD or a laptop, whatever your boat uses, they're not gonna know it's a necessarily a test. And 
Um, so you need to contact the Coast Guard on, on channel 16 at the very least. Um, and then there's false alarms. You know, we're, we're doing a MAC race. Uh, it, in the 2019 MAC race, I did overhear chatter on the, the VHF radio twice um, where a MOB device actually was deployed. And on one occasion, the Coast Guard actually launched an asset. They launched a helicopter. And that helicopter came into a vicinity that the boat Providence was in. And Providence and the, 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 and the Coast Guard was the chatter I heard. They never did find out where that signal came from, but the Coast Guard anticipated the worst and expected there to be a man overboard, but there wasn't. And so in the event that you have a false alarm, don't just go turn the unit off, get on the radio and let the boats around you know and the Coast Guard on channel 16 that you're, you had a false alarm and give the MMSI number for that device because then people will know they don't need to be concerned. The last item I wanted to mention, and some of you may know that the Vendee Globe race, which is a round the world single-handed race, occurred in the past year. And it, it finished, um, I think in January in, in France is where it started. Um, there was a man overboard in that race and, and the boat actually sunk. And this was in the Southern Ocean. And, and on that boat was a, a, the sailor was Kevin Escoffier. And Kevin, Kevin's boat did send out an EPIRB signal. And, and, and so the authorities were notified. Um, and once he got into the life raft um, and the boat actually split apart and sank, um, he remembered that in his PFD or in his uh, foul weather gear, he carried one of these MOB devices. Um, and, and he said that he um, typically does offshore racing on crewed boats when he uses this. And a lot of people on single-handed think that it's not worthwhile to have one of these devices. Um, he remembered he had it and he deployed it. Um, the other closest boat was directed to go to his last known uh, location. And when, he, when they got there, this was a boat with Jean Lacam. And, and Jean Lacam, who actually in the previous Vendee Globe uh, actually was rescued um, from his boat um, as he was a man overboard, but this time he got to rescue someone else. When he got to the location, he actually saw on his instruments an MOB beacon. And he went to that location and found Kevin Escoffier um, so that this device actually helped in, in that uh, situation. I thought I would share that story. Um, I think at this point, we've, we've been on this call an hour. I, ho I had hoped we'd get through a little quicker, but let's go to the Q and A um, and, and try to address some of these questions. Um, uh, and please bear with me here. I'm not necessarily good at, at, at toggling back and forth here. Um, the, the first question is, um, uh, if a person crews on more than one boat, it seems like reprogramming the MOB device should be just before the race. Is it easy to change later if the boat I'm on is a different one? Um, you do need to reprogram this with a laptop and you need the MMSI number. And, and from what I've been told, I, I know Phil does race on different boats and he has an ocean signal device that he's reprogrammed and it's not always easy to do. Uh, Phil, can you explain any problems you've had reprogramming it? Uh, sure, it, I mean, it's really, it's not problematic. It's just, um, you need to do it off of the boat. You need to make sure that you get the MMSI number from the skipper of the boat before you show up. 
So if I'm going to go um, race with uh, my buddy, as I'm going to do in a few weeks um, out in California, I, you know, I got to in advance get the MMSI number from him in order to um, program it. Um, and that, this will answer another question that came up in the Q&A. Do you have to remove it from the vest? No, you can actually um, keep it installed in the vest and, and, um, and hold it up against the screen. You know, it's going to be a little awkward, but you don't have to take it out of the vest to do that once you've installed it into the vest. Um, so th those are a couple of things. It's a little more difficult to um, hold the, the MOB1 or, um, or the ACR device up to the screen when you're also holding up the vest. Um, and, um, but, um, you know, other than that, you can go from boat to boat and reprogram uh, using the, uh, the procedure that I um, did in the video. And it, it's not too difficult. It's just kind of, it's a hassle. You got to, in advance, uh, you know, as a skipper, you should provide your crew members with your MMSI and, and tell them to make sure that they get their, um, their uh, MLB beacons programmed in advance. And let me let me just jump in there too, Phil. The the, the number one thing we see uh, on our end is screen brightness. Uh, that's a big issue. Um, obviously, working on a computer is best. Not in direct sunlight is best. Uh, so being a relatively dark place with your screen brightness uh, turned up as bright as possible. Uh, newer computers work better than older screens. They get a little tired. Uh, yes. We have seen people do it on iPads and iPhones and things like that, but it's not recommended because of the screen issues. Uh, and also that little lens that Phil showed you, uh, a little rubber cover, uh, makes a big difference in keeping that, that ambient light out of that, uh, that reader uh, so that it's more effective at picking up the programming screen. So th that's the biggest problem we see historically. And the rubber cover also protects your screen. <laughs> of course. Um, I, I think that I, I, I've seen a, a, at least one comment come in that, that there uh, is another manufacturer of an MOB device that has both AIS and DSC. Um, and, and again, you know, technology, as we all see, changes all the time. And so, um, you know, ben I, ben, I think you mentioned to me that you've tested some of these devices. Um, are, are you familiar with any other devices that, that have both AIS and DSC for, for personal MOB? Uh, the only one uh, that I knew of pr prior to um, this call was the, the Ocean Signal and the ACR. Uh, I'm familiar with Aqua Ventures and they have a, I, I'm, blanking on their name in commercial service as well. They have a different name in commercial service. Um, but uh, I have not had an opportunity to test this unit hands-on. Uh, I did follow the link that was put in the Q&A. And one thing that I do notice off the bat is it does look like it's a little bit larger, um, but that's about the extent of what I know. Well, thanks. Um, there, There's a question here that says continuing the the other boat's MOB displays question mark. If another boat has an MOB nearby, um, um, you know, I I think if if there's more than one MOB within a five mile radius, there are boats that may see on if they have AIS, they will see on a chart plotter two MOB signals. And you aren't going to know who those are coming from and what boats they were on. Um, you will have a lat lan, a location for them that's shown. And I guess if you're if you're able to get yellow brick, you might be able to um, uh, through process of elimination know who it is. But but you're going to just see an MMSI number. And for these devices, they all start with the three numbers, 972. Um, so if there are two people in the water and, and you know, typically this is probably going to occur during a storm um, that, that people go overboard, it's not gonna happen on a sunny day with 10 knots of breeze. Um, 
but if these if you see these signals it should alert you that that there is a distress call and assistance is required um, and and you need to get on your radio and treat it as if it's a, a man overboard and provide assistance if you're in the general vicinity and rick real quick um even though the msi start with the same number uh and notifying that this is an MOB device and then the manufacturer code comes after that. But after that, it's a unique number. So every MMSI number will be different. So you will see different numbers on the screen. Right. Um, there is a question. Um, and, and again, you know, I'm not going to go over all of the requirements we have for the Chicago Mac race. And I, I know people feel that, that the, Safety requirements is a lengthy list, but um, you know you need to have your radio on. You need to have the MMSI number programmed into your radio. Um, you, I would suggest that if you've never used the DSC feature on your radio, figure out how it works and use it. Make a call to another boat. This, this is the, the technology is out there, and and we don't want to wait till till a disaster to, to use these features for the first time. Um, there is a question about uh, when, once activated, does the battery need to be replaced before reuse? Um, and Rich, I'll let you answer that. Uh, ideally, yes, uh, but you can test the unit. It will kind of give you an indication of the battery strength. If this unit just went off for a few seconds, not a big deal. Uh, and remember, MOBs are designed to be fairly quick response, right? Within about 15 seconds or so of you hitting the water, this unit's transmitting. Hopefully that vessel picks you up right away that you came off of, comes back and gets you, and you've only spent a very short period of time in the water. Um, if you've had a full-blown event, we definitely encourage you to get the battery replaced. But uh, like I said, if it was just a very short interval, probably okay. Self-tests will definitely give you uh, a good idea where it stands. And Rich, the, the battery, I, I think it's, is it five years or seven years? Seven years, seven year life, shelf life on the battery. And it's designed when brand new and fresh to transmit for more than 24 hours. Of course, length of time, uh, weather conditions, especially temperature affects uh, battery transmission. And then of course, how many times it's been tested, how many times it's been reprogrammed. Everything uses a little bit of memory, a little bit of battery life over the life of the unit. Although it's designed into the unit to withstand a, a, a fair amount of that. Uh, if you did that an awful lot, in other words, if you were reprogramming that MMSI every day, uh, I wouldn't expect that that was gonna last seven years. But uh, for the most part, um, the, these units will last quite a long time and have a, a, a good amount of flexibility to them. Rich, there, there's some functionality in uh, MLV1, uh, isn't there, that shows you the state of battery? Yeah, when you do the testing, uh, so that you, you saw some of the testing applications like testing DSC that Phil was able to show you in the video. Uh, a basic test is just to hold the T down for, for just a little over a second or so. And it will run through a series of checks. Like I said, it'll check the strobe light. It'll check the antenna. It'll check the board. And it'll check the battery. And it'll even indicate battery life. So it'll give you flashes of light and specific colors mean different things. Uh, so depending on what the response is when you do the test, you'll see if the battery is, is in brand new shape, uh, very high end shape. If it's in the mid range shape that it's still functional and will still work just fine, but it's not tip top or if it's bad and you should get it replaced. So a lot of information when you do the tests, no doubt. And then Rich, there was, there's a question about going through the test feature that, that Phil showed us. And, and Phil showed us the, the DSC response. Does that test also test for AIS? It's a separate test along the lines of what Phil did, push and hold the, the button for a certain amount of time, and then it will test AIS as well. The difference with the AIS test, uh, and it's one of the things that Phil was, was working on and trying to do in the wintertime inside is a little tough, is the unit needs to be free and clear and have a GPS, uh, the ability to receive GPS to be able to do a full AIS test. So it's not something you can do indoors very easily unless you can be nearby a window or somewhere where you can happen to get a GPS signal to the unit, then you could do a full AIS test. So there's three tests. There's the unit itself test. There's the DSC test, which Phil showed you. And then there's the AIS test, which you have to have the ability to be out and receive GPS in. Okay, great. 
Uh, there's a question about uh, some of these pages and, and lists uh, and screens um, uh, made available for download. I, I think we can, uh, we will send out uh, supplemental information to everyone that's attended today, um, you know, uh, once we pull everything together. So we will make that available. Um, Let's see, there's a question. Uh, someone with one of these MOB devices goes in the water. Will it, uh, most of us use, probably have VHF radios and MFDs, multi-function displays from different manufacturers. Assuming someone goes in the water, will it appear there are two people in the water, one from the DSC and one from the AIS? Or will the VHF and MFD recognize it as only one person? Um, ben, Rich? Well, I think the DSC call is going to go to the boat you fell off of. Oh, and yeah. only that. Only the MMSI yeah. is programmed to. Right. So, so in that VHF, if it's a modern, if it's a, a fairly current radio, will actually go into an alarm. And that alarm, that screeching alarm you'll hear, you probably don't need to hear it on the boat they fell off of because you probably know someone fell off your boat. But in any case, the VHF radio will, will let you know um, that there's an alarm and give you some information. And if you have AIS and it's, it's feeding information to either a chart plotter, an MFD, or a laptop, whatever your boat uses, um, it'll also show you information. It will give you the MMSI number, I believe, um, but- I would expect that the MFD is, you are likely to see duplication, but as you indicated, Rick, um, and it's just, this is just on the one boat that the person came off of. All the other boats are just gonna get this via AIS. So they're only gonna see one target. I would expect you would see duplication. I would expect it would be very, apparent that it's the same MMSI and probably, you know, you, you're going to work off of one source or the other would be my expectation. The only way you would see two on an MFD is if the HF radio is configured for bi-directional communications to the MFD in a, a lot of, I would venture to say most cases, uh, VHF radios typically are only connected to uh, 0183 receive newer NEMA 2000 equipped VHF radios might be doing bi-directional communications and putting that uh, DSC distress waypoint on the MFD as well as the AIS distress. Uh, you know, a pretty small percentage of the cases would be my guess. Right. And that and that icon that the when you're looking on a multifunction display uh, from an AIS or a, as as uh, Ben was just explaining, if a DSC is sending information back to the chart plotter, it will put an, a man overboard icon. I know if you've ever looked at your chart plotters, you see an MOB button on there. And if you ever push that button, you see it drops an icon in your position. So that's exactly what you'll see. And that's exactly how this works. And on every MFD I've ever tested, by the way, that icon is a person with their hands over their head. It's correct. It's fairly clear that it's an MOB icon um, and grabs your attention pretty well. There's a question here. Um, someone says, uh, with these complexities and very, oh, my questions keep toggling. Complexities and variations per radio. Um, does, does, does this suggest that we have fleet level testing session on the wall this early summer? Um, we are planning to have a, um, an event um, and again, pending harbors being open and, and racing going on uh, in, in May, June, where um, we may try to actually um, have a, uh, an, uh, an ocean signal MOB1 deployed. We're, we're coordinating with the Coast Guard uh, for a date. And, um, and then we would let other people know. So if you've got an AIS, um, and we'll let you know uh, when this will occur, both date and time, and, and you can test, uh, other boats will be able to test your equipment uh, in this uh, event. Um, and 
yeah, as we develop this, we will send out notifications to uh, uh, the Mac, uh, Mac race participants to, to let them know. So um, I think- But that can I just circle back on that to, unless that MLB1 is programmed to the specific MSI of each radio in that test, the only test that the other boats will receive is via AIS. They will not get the DSC test. Correct. Correct. So we are working on putting something together. I think that, you know, knowing these devices, how they work and, and, and testing them and, and testing your equipment on your boat uh, is important. So um, we, we hope to be able to do that this spring and we hope to all be on boats and, and, um, and hopefully the 2021 racing season will be um, better than the 2020 racing season was. Um, CMSR requires all boats to carry two DSC equipped radios. And I believe that's both a permanently installed DSC radio and a handheld. Um, the change requiring an additional handheld was made a few years ago. Each radio has its own MMSI. Beyond the antenna height, therefore line of sight range, please discuss advantages, disadvantages to using one MMSI slash radio versus another. Um, I, I would program both radios to have the same MMSI. Um, that, that would be the correct way to, to handle that. Um, if you saw in the demonstration when I test, tested, um, that unit, um, the handheld and the, um, and the fixed below deck both had the same MMSI. And, uh, you know, that way you would, each of the MOBs would be programmed with the MMSI for the boat and both VHF radios would pick up um, the MMSI distress signal, uh, the DSC distress signal. And do you have anything to add since you, you much more familiar with all this other equipment than, than I am? Um, would you say that that's a, a best practice to use the same MMSI number for any VHF radios on a boat? It is indeed. Um, you know, I think the, the, the complexity comes from crew who might change from boat to boat. Um, and that that assumes one thing which is that the handheld is it, it that the cruise handheld is also dsc equipped that's a really small subset of the handheld radios out there um the 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 two that are uh required for max safety considerations yes i think absolutely should be on the same mmsi um my understanding is that when a boat registers for the mac they're they're registering with a single mmsi I would expect that any radio that's going to communicate on behalf of that, you know, at that boat should, should also be transmitting that MMSI. Um, you know, it, it would only serve to confuse uh, a rescue attempt if there's a, an unknown secondary MMSI in the mix. Okay. Uh, just, just a word of caution and Phil and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong. It's been many years since I worked for the VHF manufacturers, but uh, most VHFs, at least in the past, didn't allow you to just keep changing MMSI numbers randomly like you can do in the MOB1. So be very careful about just constantly programming or thinking you're going to be constantly reprogramming your VHFs with di different MMSIs. It doesn't work like that. You, you are not wrong. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it, it's so in some cases, and in fact, quite a few cases, you would need to get the manufacturers involved in the process for reprogramming the MMSI on um, your VHF radio. And so, um, yeah, I'd recommend that, you know, the boat be equipped with um, a handheld and a fixed mount and that they both be, you know, permanently part of the boat. Um, we are at, uh, uh, on my clock, 11.22. So we're, we're just gonna go till 1130, uh, try to get to as many questions as we can. So um, we are gonna, gonna wrap it up here. I know some people have already dropped off and we've still got a hundred people on. So we'll try to get as many questions as we can um, before 1130. Um, so there is a question here and it sounds like this has to do um, with the, um, the 
installation app. Uh, apparently, uh, someone says, what is MMSI group on the install app? So there must be something on the install app that asks for an MMSI group. Um, does that make, does that ring any bells for anyone? Rich, you want to address that? It is definitely an option. Well, I was going to say, you, you, you kind of highlighted it a little bit, well, not directly in your video, but maybe you can go ahead and reference what you saw or you were showing, I don't know if you can pull your, even your, your feedback up. Yeah, well, when you open up the screen for the MMSI programming, it's got two options. It's MMSI and MMSI and MMSI group. You should select the single MMMSI number. Um, and Rich, can you uh, elaborate on what the group um, is for and used for? Well, well like, like a group MMSI in the DSC, if you're familiar with that, it's an extension of, uh, of, of that protocol. So you can actually be part of a group, uh, a group uh, capability. So like with a DSC call on a radio, you can you have your own MMSI number, your own individual number, and then you have a group number. So if you wanted to bring everybody, let's say, in the Yacht Club to your attention on a group call, you could. Uh, and it follows the same, the same logic as that. In other words, remember this is the MOBs were created after DSC, so they try to take what DSCs can do and incorporate them into the MOBs. It might be something to think about in the future to increase the range on these things to other boats that are participating. Oh, there's a question about, um, is there room for a personal light on the life vest in addition to the MOB device? I, I think that, um, you know, as we all start carrying more and more equipment, um, yeah, you know, and, and as Phil said, when he went through his, his video, he used a spin lock because it's, it's a little tighter uh, and harder to work with than a Mustang and, and some of the other PFDs out there, inflatable PFDs. Um, I think you just have to, to, to work with each of the PFDs you have and see what fits. And, and keep in mind that the MOBs do come with strobe lights. Uh, so they do have a light that will be activated once the unit's on uh, as well. So not that it would, I would discourage you from trying to put an additional light on there. Uh, but in many cases, you'll have other places on the jacket to be able to include a light as well. So I would think the answer to that would be yes. Phil, anything to add? No, I, I think, you know, there's there's room in there. It just gets tight, you know. There's definitely, you could put another light in there. Um, you know, you've got the whole other side um, and there's room a little higher than the inflation tube to, to mount some things. Um, but, you know, it's a personal, and a lot of, most times, people install uh, personal lights on the outside of the vest. Um, so, you know, it's not really an issue for um, fitting it inside the enclosed uh, cover. So um, I, I don't think there's an issue with getting a personal light on there as well. Okay. Um, there's a question about, will, will the lat line show up on the VHF radio screen when it receives the DSC call? And, and Phil, it was a little hard to see the screens of the radios in your video. Mm -hmm. What information did you see on those screens? So, you know, the answer to this question is really that it's specific to your VHF radio. Okay, what you're going to see on the screen. On the screen for the, the model of the VHFs that I was using on Vincitori are B&G uh, paired units. So um, what they showed uh, was that it was a station-to-station -station routine um, DSC call, and, and then it also displayed the MMSI number of the MOB1, and that's kind of what you get on that particular screen. So that's another good reason to test to see what you get. Now, um, the test I did wouldn't certainly display that because it had no AIS signal, um, and it also did not, um, you know, have a lat lawn um, because it couldn't acquire a GPS signal. So um, with the test that I used, uh, which is strictly a DSC test, you're only gonna see um, the MMSI uh, number from the sending station, which is the MOB1. Phil, and the reason you didn't have those signals is because Vincitori is, is inside a warehouse and doesn't have the antenna 
coverage. Exactly. We, um, you know, didn't have the opportunity to uh, kind of very cold this week. We had hoped to move a boat out and actually run this test and the simulation outside, but um, everything's below freezing. So um, we'll, we weren't able to do the full simulation of the AIS uh, deployment. Right. There is a comment here. Somebody is asking, uh, how about a discount coupon uh, to reduce the price for uh, Mac racers? And, and I, I think that that's, that's a possibility and, um, and, and we'll work on that with, with ACR um, and, and more information to come uh, if, if that is available. Um, You know, uh, someone again taught, says, as, as, as we've done with flare demonstrations, would the uh, Race to Mac committee and or Chicago Yacht Club be willing to, to act as the conduit with US Coast Guard and set up a demo test location in time? I think, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're working on that and we'll um, notify uh, Mac participants um, in the event that we are able to do some type of demonstration. Rick. Yes. What, there was a question from uh, a little earlier about does the MLB one ho only hold one MMSI at a time? In other words, after you've programmed and tested the MMSI for boat one, then changed to boat two and programmed and tested, and that is boat one's retained. Uh, I think it's important to clarify one boat only and no memory effectively. So if you are changing from boat one to boat two, you're going to clear boat one's information. If you now need to go back, you're going to reprogram and you're going to do that each time. It's, it's not a particularly arduous process, you know, as alluded to, you need to make sure that the monitor is bright enough and all of that, but one at a time. And the fact that you've programmed two or three previously certainly does not mean that it will transmit to those two or three MMSIs if it is activated. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, I'm gonna wrap up with one final item. And, um, you know, our, our uh, Race to Mac committee has, has been working on uh, uh, some of the database involved with with both the invited competitors and crew, and um, and within all the crew profiles, which are now for the first year to be controlled by each individual crew member. So if you have a crew profile, you can go in and and you find that going to the Mac Race website. Um, and, and you can find your profile and go in there and update it. And, and you can update it with your experience, but we also ask for MMSI numbers for MOB devices if you carry one. We ask for the identification codes for PLBs if you carry them. And, 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 and I suggest that everyone update this information. Um, that is going to help us and the Coast Guard during the race in the event that something goes off because we will have the MMSI numbers for everyone that puts this information in. So, um, you know, please everybody look at your profiles and, and update them with accurate and descriptive information. With that, I'd like to thank the participants today, um, Phil, Rich and Ben um, I, I know this is just uh, opening the door up uh, as far as in information and, and education on these devices, and, and we hope to do more in the future. Um, I, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, um, and um, you know I'll, I'll end with um, know your equipment and own your equipment. So with that. Thank you everyone for attending and um, have a great weekend and we look forward to seeing you out in the water this uh, sailing season. Thanks for having us. Thank you everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Bye.